Ladies and gentlemen, welcome here in the, the National, uh, the Netherlands Institute for Architecture. Uh, it's a very nice and cozy place. We are closing the curtains for you so you can see the screen of me and the speakers for you this whole afternoon. It's uh, very nice that you're here today. We're going to talk about uh, mobility, but first I'll introduce myself. My name is Hans de Jong. I am in the Netherlands a radio talk show host. And we'll do this in English because we have some foreign guests. Very much welcome to you as well. We love that, that you came all the way from Germany, but some from Jakarta as well. So, uh, well, so for some of us, it's it's been a long day, but it's we are very glad that you're here today, um, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to talk about uh, mobility, and that is well a pretty broad expression, of course. So maybe it's good to frame that in a little bit today. We are going to talk about uh, mobility, labor mobility, of course, because that's what PLM stands for. We'll talk about that later. But it is, um, I would like to define mobility, the movement of people, because that's actually what we're going to talk about today. Um, and we are going to look at mobility of people from four different angles. Uh, we've, we have some pretty neat speakers actually. We have a doctor, we have a policy maker, an expert manager, an architect, who all look from a different angle to mobility, to the movement of people. And we would like to learn from them and look from their perspective. So that's what we're going to do today. And, and the question, the main question of today is what makes people move? What makes people um, mobile, uh, what are they searching, what are their goals, how can you steer them, and if they have left the country of origin and, well, travel to some place, what to, do we do with them then? Do they have to assimilate? Do we try to assimilate to them? How, do you, how does that work? Um, well, that's what we're going to talk today about. And uh, actually, the, the main thing is how do we attract and bind international talent? And that's all what ELM is about. And well, the one who has made her business model around attracting talent and binding talent, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call her on the stage. And I would like you to give her a very warm applause. Ladies and gentlemen, applause for Lynette Hitmason. Good that you're here. Good that you're here. Um, somebody's phone is ringing, yes? Well, it's an international call, I see. Um, Annette, you're the boss. Uh, well, yes. Yes, you are the boss of ELM. You started your company 20 years ago. That's right. Uh, and and to, is it today your birthday party of, of ELM, or is it this week, this uh, month? Well, not really. It was around the 5th of May, but uh, we thought this was a better date because we could all assimilate to one another and it would work perfectly, but it's not going to work like that. Um, you mentioned uh, Germany. We also talked about the UK. For those of you in the audience who are aware of what we exactly do, you might know that we work very close with the UK. And um, a contract with Germany was delayed for more than a year because uh, in the UK they thought it wasn't that important to talk about the exact figures something like 99 euro per international student. That was more or less the figure. And for somebody from the UK, that will do. It's about the overall perspective making it work. Whether the German person on the other end said, something like 99 euro, can you be? Is it 99 euro or, well, 99 or 100? I'm not really sure was what the British counterpart said when that deal, uh, deal was canceled because you Oops. don't talk about more or less an amount, you have a specific amount. And how, much, how much was the value of that deal? Uh, that deal was uh, very costly. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, so that, with, uh, uh, with those cultural, little cultural differences... Little cultural differences, deals just not knowing how precise you need to be. Right. Um, yeah. You have one slide, and that's that one. <laughs> what the... is this? Um, well, uh, I'll give a lot of presentations for students also, students looking for work in other countries. And I usually have this slide up and it says, uh, job hunting abroad does culture matter. And it's very interesting to see the responses from the people in the audience, because there will be coaches that say, for instance, the Asian people look at it and say, yeah, 
you have to be really precise to hit the target. Uh, and they see nothing weird in it. Uh, the Germans will say, definitely this is a Photoshop picture, because this is impossible, nobody will sit there like that. I've never seen any serious Dutch response. All the Dutch people start laughing straight away. I think it's hilarious and funny. Um, so there's different responses to it. And I've no idea whether it's a real picture. Or I didn't take it myself, but most pictures I took myself, this one not. Uh, it might be photoshopped, I don't know, but I use it just to get the reactions from people in the audiences. Yeah, all right. You, your, your, your business model is about uh, attracting and inviting international talent. Yeah. I would like to ask one question from you, and then Lynette is going to answer that. <coughs> uh, what do you think is top three priority in finding international talent? What do you think is the most important thing? Maybe someone who wants to just shout it. It can be in Dutch if you want to. Somebody from the audience. This, you're all experts, you're all invited by Nanette. What's very important? What do you think? Experience. It's hospitality, one. Thank you, thank you. Experience. Experience. What kind of experience? All right, all right. Experience, very important. Hospitality. This, this side of, yeah. Education. Education, all right. Something else. Something else. Sorry? Safety. Safety. Oh, in the country itself. All right. <laughs> So, so you won't end up like that. <laughs> Mommy, I've got a new job in Singapore. Really? Yes. Okay. Something else, something else. Mentality. Mentality? Who said that? Or why do you say that? All right, all right, yeah. Okay, so you have to have a match in, in mentality. Right, so, somebody else. International experience. International experience, thank you very much. Do you, do you, sir, have international experience? Do you regret that? Yes, I <laughs> Sir, you have. Sorry? Flexibility. Flexibility, right. F from the, from the uh, applicant point of view, to be flexible. All right, you have. Career options? Career options? Uh, so, uh, a, a host country or a, a, a company has to have lots of career options. All right, and, and which university are you uh, representing? Well, mostly our uh, students from the Rotterdam School of Management. All right. Here in Rotterdam, the Erasmus uh, yeah. University. All right, great. Lynette, what is, uh, did, did, did you I hear everything? They, well, yeah, they gave pretty much all the answers that, are, uh, that you should give. I think it's a combination of labor market opportunities, uh, people giving the right education to start safety uh, for international students, it's safety is key. If it's not, do they really ask? If it, is it safe in the Netherlands? No. Well, if you're a Chinese parent and you have one child, you have two ki kids. But if you have just one child, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you send that one child to go and study somewhere, you definitely want to make sure it's kind of safe. So it's not so much the kids, but it's the parents. And parents then we put them in a, uh, to Dutch phrase, a Dutch phrase, the Zeker that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, yes. 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 Being really hospitable. Really, to we're, we're very hospitable. Yeah, we think. Yeah, yeah. we think. But, but it's not true. Um, no, uh, I don't know. Do you have any foreign colleagues at your? Uh, at a Dutch radio station. Well, we had some Flemish colleagues. We have some <laughs> Flemish. Well, that's very international. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> if they're staying in Amsterdam, yeah. um, do you take them? Do you invite them no. over for dinner? No. no. No, if you were to go to Australia, you would be a radio host in Australia the first few evenings of the initial six months of your stay. Really? I think every evening you would have We actually let them drown sometimes. We yeah. just let them it's like, do their Oh, own this thing. is your office, this yeah. is your computer. Yeah, have that, fun. Yeah, and that, um, we had a phone call not that long ago from a company that said that we have a little bit of an issue. We've um, hired top. Indian graduates, IT graduates, they must be top of the bill, 
with your wife and you. We did everything. This that was we in were, Holland. It was in Holland. Yeah. We did everything that we were supposed to do. We left them in their office, told them what to do, gave them instructions, sort of like, here's your computer, here's the paperwork, have fun. Um, and then after three days, they were almost in the same situation, <laughs> still sitting behind the table, not doing anything. What's wrong with these people? Well, if you're from India, you're never going to be a self-starter, never, but it's very unlikely that you will just say, okay, I'll press on and I'll start doing what I think is right. All right, so we really have to bear in mind those cultural differences, otherwise our productivity will go down and down. And the fun will go down and down and down. Now that well, we'll see you at, at the break because we have a little bit of a test for the audience. Yep. And at the end, we'll see you. A round of applause for Manette Hitmaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we, we are going to, we're going to start with looking from those four different angles. And we're going to do that in this particular way. Uh, well, you can read, so I'm going to not read to that to you. But we're going to start with somebody who I, I really thought long and hard about it. Because um, what makes people move? Uh, how do we influence that? And we search for somebody who designs those interactions. And, 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 and who has to think very long and hard about that. Because if he has made a decision, it's really rock solid. It, it, it will be there for 20 years. He's an architect. Uh, his company is the architect of the shipping and uh, transport collegia here in Rotterdam. He uh, is also the architect of the Institute of Sound and Vision in Hilversum. I was there yesterday. It's a beautiful building. How does he move people? Ladies and gentlemen, give him a warm applause. Professor Michiel Rida. just revealed to uh, uh, our host, I just revealed to our host the secret of a lecture of an architect. And there's one key secret, is that whether the topic is sustainability or whether the topic is modern financing in real estate or whether the topic is mobility, eventually either architect will talk about his or her own work. <coughs> So, since you know the secret right now, and I immediately <coughs> tell everything you ought to know, I'll start with something else. I will present to you a story, a threefold story, with a small prologue, let's say a main part, and a small epilogue. And the story is indeed about our own work, but at the same time, at the same time I would like to address the notion of perspective. And I would like to address the notion of perspective related to mobility. And hence, although it's about my own work, the work of our office, still, let's say, the, the, the lecture has this kind of poetic title called The Voyage and the Map. Since talking about mobility or talking about movement, and especially talk, talking about movement of people through space or through society or through their career, you always should, let's say, delineate an idea of a map, or you should delineate an idea of how you can understand this movement and how you can perceive this movement. And the way to, to understand this movement is by defining a map, a map of your own world, a map of your own career, a map of society. And in architecture, since I'm an architect, we always consider ourselves the center of the universe. And we didn't, let's say, develop that much since the Ptolemaic view on the world. And essentially, if you would like to understand movement, and if you would like to understand labor mobility or movement through space, you should be aware of the fact that although we know that Earth isn't the center of the universe. Although we know that apparently, let's say, the universe is something quite different, eventually we will always act as if we are the center of the universe. And it's very, let's say, important to realize that, whether you're in a European cultural setting or whether you're in 
uh, non-European cultural setting, eventually in order to understand perspectives on movement or on mobility, your main viewpoint always starts here. And your main viewpoint always starts with perceiving the world, let's see, looking around you, understanding the world from your own perspective. And as soon as you're aware of that, and as soon as you're aware of that, that although we've moved along since the Ptolemaic view on the world, we should understand that mobility is a twofold, let's say, question. Understanding what kind of perspective you have while moving through space, moving through a country, moving through a map, traveling from stage to stage, and what kind of cultural denomination or cultural elements you integrate in that question. So, as I already said, let's say architects can only talk about their own work. Let's say, starting from this cultural notion and starting with the notion of perspective and, and defining your life or movement as a definition of a map and a definition of a map based on a personal, let's say, fascination or based on personal uh, experiences, I would like to discuss work of our office and I would like to discuss the work of our office through the lens of mobility or through the lens of movement. And eventually, movement is something, let's say, harsh, something difficult, something tough, something tangible that really, let's say, works in either aspect of your body. This picture, although rather abstract, will, let's say, or tries to convey to you an idea uh, that is key in order, in order to understand our architecture. Of course, architect, let's say architect, architecture in general, architecture shouldn't move. Let's say the essence of architecture is that it doesn't move. Whenever you have experience, for instance, an earthquake or a heavy earthquake, let's say one of the fundamental anxieties of people is that as soon as buildings start to move, let's say it really changes your perspective on life. So we make inert, <coughs> solid buildings that remain grounded forever, not for 20 years, but hopefully, as either architect would claim, forever. So this picture tries to convey the idea that as a tension or as a counterpoint to this inertia of the built substance, the inertia of this built volume, the movement of people through space, let's say this changing perspective of this Ptolemaic oriented person through this space is key or let's say essential to understand <coughs> your building, but also to understand the way we design. I selected, and of course in that sense it wasn't a coincidence that Renz just referred to it, I selected two buildings out of these uh, what is it, 16, 16 buildings or something, I selected two buildings that in a way comprise two different approaches towards movement or towards mobility. And in essence, the one building, the first building I will try to explain to you, let's say all movement or all mobility in the building is conceived from the heart of the volume. So, in order to understand the building, and also in order to understand, again, this kind of Ptolemaic artistic view on life, uh, everything starts from the heart of this volume. Everything is to be understood from the heart of the volume. That's, the, for you, the picture on the left-hand side, Institute for Sound and Vision. The other mm -hmm. drawing tries to convey an idea about moving through the periphery of a volume, or let's say moving across the borders or along the borders of an assignment. So in order to understand, let's say, these, <coughs> these two different polar approaches towards mobility or towards understanding a topic, you could, let's say, start in the heart of it and extend your knowledge of a certain idea 
or the thinking building, in this case, from the heart of the topic, or you can understand, let's say, the topic or the building at hand, in this case, by moving through the periphery and understanding the periphery of the building. So this polarity is in order to, let's say, get back to the issue of the afternoon, I think of utmost importance also to understand labor mobility. Whereas if you, let's say, transfer from the Netherlands to another place in the world, let's say you could always, let's say, remain in the periphery of a culture or you should kind of dare to step in and to understand a culture or a future professional setting from the heart of it or from the center of it. So I'll will briefly try to convey to you, let's say, the organization of the Institute of Sound and Vision in Hilversum. Hilversum is a, is a small town near Amsterdam. Um, and we designed, in Hilversum, we designed National Institute for Sound and Vision. This institute comprises all archives uh, related to uh, audiovisual industry <coughs> since the invention of the media. So whatever has been broadcasted either on radio or on television or on non-fiction cinema is stored here. So the building contains a gigantic archive. It contains a museum in order to uh, convey elements from the archive and to show it to the larger audience, but it also contains a kind of professional part where you can buy seconds. For instance, when a Dutch prince would die or when there's a national anniversary, the uh, news uh, reels on the television buy their seconds there in order to have let's say the queen on the horse or uh, a famous soccer player making his final winning goal and it's stored there. Hence the building is conceived out of five different elements. So the colored the color blocks represent the, the programmatic defined parts and the non-colored block, the transparent colored block is in fact the center, the heart of this institute, that binds all these different programmatic entities together. So in the heart of the building, as we already stated, as a kind of opening statement of my uh, lecture, in order to understand the building, you should, let's say, understand the heart of this institute. Hence, in the heart of the building, there's a kind of large open space that binds together these four drif different programmatic entities of the building. The building is subterraneous for half of it, and since the building is subterraneous, uh, you enter through a bridge, over a bridge, a large entrance bridge in the building. And at the same time, as you can see, from either, let's say, from, oops, sorry, from either level in the building you can perceive all different other programmatic entities in the building. So the building is composed out of these four distinct elements. The archive, gigantic archive, the museum hovering above you and a large office part where let's say everything that relates to this archive is being organized and being handled. As I already claimed, in order to understand mobility, but also in order to understand this design, after entering over this bridge into the heart of the building, you can directly enter into the museum, you can directly enter into the office building, you can directly enter into the subterraneous archives, or you can go to this space, for instance, where they sell these seconds. So talking about mobility or talking about architecture in general is by taking a position vis-a-vis -vis this assignment, of course, but also trying to understand in advance whether you would like to convey an idea in such a way that the building is to be understood from the heart, in this case, where, let's say, of course, either element the building remains 
stable and remains inert, unmoved, and that people, let's say, move from this center through the building. And you, of course, from that element, you can enter into the museum, a large museum. I won't explain that to you. Or you can enter the restaurant, just chill. And eventually, of course, you always return here into the heart. You could go to the restaurant down there, or you could cross the bridge again and leave the building. Eventually, this is the last thing I would like to briefly show you about this building is that the building is also to be understood as an image in the modern avalanche of images. And related to the famous picture of Willem van Haagt, the cabinet of Dr. van der Geest, uh, we try to conceive images in the building that are to be understood as moving images, as a kind of colored ghosts that are integrated in the glass of the facade. And although since I'm always way too slow in my speeches and I'm trying to speed up and I always think, ah, oh, I only have 20 minutes and I only have seven minutes left. So I'll skip a lot. But the thing is why I still would like to show you this is the fact that movement or mobility is also to be conceived as a kind of changing let's say, notion of time, a changing notion of your position on the map, also a changing notion in time. And what we did in this building, since it's the Institute of Sound and Vision, you don't have a Mona Lisa. You only have, let's say, elements in your collection that are to be understood when it's displayed on the screen or when you hear the sound <coughs> while played in the, let's say, in the computer. And as soon as the sound stops, there's nothing left. As you know, yeah? when the music stops, music disappears. So we thought that we should make something, or we should convey an idea of mobility, or of, let's say changing nature, by casting these colored images in glass. And as you can understand, since the sun moves, yeah? you remain on one position on the earth, but the sun still moves 24 hours a day. And then the color of the main spaces change due to the fact that the sun is stirring. The color of the colored glass reflects in the image. And eventually, mobility is to be understood as a kind of permanent transformation of the world around you. Briefly. <laughs> I'll explain you a museum we just uh, let's say not just, we uh, realized a, a year ago, or which opened a year ago, precisely a year ago, in Antwerp. And the museum is to be understood as kind of gigantic stacking of large boxes. Boxes containing everything a city collects over hundreds of years. It, it has an incredible collection of tangible pieces, opposed to the Institute of Sound and Vision, where every, everything is ephemeral and untangible. In this case, everything is tangible. They have beautiful Rubens paintings, beautiful Rogier van der Weyne paintings, and also trash. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but uh, uh, let's say uh, 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 mundane elements of everyday life. <laughs> to rephrase my previous words. Um, the idea of these boxes is that either box contains parts of this, uh, uh, it's a stacking of boxes, contains, an, let's say, part of this collection, and there's a gigantic escalator route going up from grade to the top of the building, and it spir spirals around these boxes, and it spirals over these boxes, and this route is glazed. So in contrast to the Institute of Sound and Vision, let's say, in this case, mobility, let's say, is essentially organized in the periphery of the volume and is essentially to be understood as a large staircase winding up a 60 meter high uh, museum tower and eventually ending, eventually ending on the roof platform. So 
talking about mobility, I'm talking about, let's say, moving your body through space. In this case, due to a lot of escalators, you kind of elegantly move up to the top. But in this case, mobility is directly un to be understood vis-a-vis -vis the relation with the surrounding urban fabric. So if you understand, if you're in grade, if you're downstairs in this building, you only see, let's say, the buildings in a direct vicinity. And if you move up, eventually you have this kind of gigantic, overwhelming view over the city. So talking about labor mobility or talking about mobility through architecture or in architecture, let's say mobility of also always offers you the possibility of distancing yourself and let's say relating yourself with the surrounding map or relating yourself with the surrounding city and kind of offering yourself new viewpoints that were never there before and eventually like every architect i will proudly present you the interior of this building and of course, I don't show you mundane elements of everyday life, nor beautiful Rogier van der Weide paintings. I would only like to s express the kind of sturdy, solid, inert character of architecture. <coughs> Eventually, either building relates to its surroundings. Eventually, either design should relate to the context, to its natural or cultural context and to its direct physical context. As I already stated in my opening statement, let's say understanding your position on the map in the world is also understanding the position of a building in a cultural sense or in a physical sense. In this case, if you move up through this building, you have a, let's say, a beautiful view on the square. The square contains a large uh, painting, or, or, or not necessarily a painting, I don't know the English word actually, a mosaic by a painter called Luc Tuinmans. And Luc Tuinmans paid a tribute to Quinten Matzeis. Quinten Matzeis, who is the author of this beautiful early Flemish school painting, Quinten Matzeis was the founding father of the Flemish school. But Quinten Matzeis was a highly controversial person in Antwerp. He was that controversial since he was homosexual that he was not allowed to be buried in the cathedral of the city. Eventually, Luc Tuinmont, very well-known contemporary painter, uh, used or based a new <coughs> painting on, let's say, the dark mask of Quinten Matzeis as a tribute <coughs> to Quinten Matzeis. And this painting is eventually part of the square design of our tower in Antwerp. So if you go up through this passage of escalators, eventually if you're on the eighth floor, you have a splendid view on this painting. And the drawing is not upside down because you have to imagine that you change your perspective and you look from the tower back on this square and eventually you will see this. So if you would like to understand architecture, or if you would like to understand movement through space, you should always be aware of the notion of perspective and the notion of where you are in life and where you're going in life. I'm almost finished. As I started with my opening claim about defining your position on the map and understanding your position in the world by moving through the world, moving either through the periphery of the building or through the heart of the building, eventually this is all, let's say, a matter of perspective. And architecture, since it's not a free art, we always work, let's say, assigned by somebody else, you should always try to understand what perspective is articulated. And that also counts for mobility. If you would like to understand people moving through time, moving through their career, moving through space, 
you always should understand. This is a very, very intriguing painting. Since in the, it's called uh, the, the marriage of Mr. Arnold Finney and his wife, made by Jan van Eyck in 1432, and it offers a splendid view on perspective. Since in the heart of the painting, in the heart of the painting, there's the painter himself conveying at least two ideas that although we see Mr. and Mrs. Arnold Fini, we should be aware of the fact that we always see ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions for you because I, I love uh, I loved your presentation and, and the, where can we see this draw this painting? Do you know? Um, National Gallery in London. All right, that's worth the trip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, well, from an uh, architectural point of view, because you make beautiful buildings, and and, and uh, as I said earlier, I, I was yesterday at the Sound and Vision, and although it's a big building, you feel comfortable in that building. And what I was wondering about is, how do you know from scratch, when you're drawing at your table or your computer, I don't know how you do that, how do you know if people feel themselves comfortable in what you are designing of that moment? You, you make an estimated guess, of course. Mm -hmm. But the only way to understand it is to change your perspective, and to understand what you can see and what I can see and whether I let's say, are able to, let's say, uh, translate or transcend my own position in such a way that I can understand what you would like to see or what you would like to experience while visiting a building. But how do you do that? Do, do, you, do you really literally crawl into your drawing? or what do No, you no. What we do in order to test our buildings, we also draw scenarios. And that's a, an incredible, fascinating tool, in fact. So, for instance, for the Institute of Sound and Vision, we presented our client, let's say, five different scenarios uh, conveying the idea of a party, conveying the idea of a, I don't know, royal wedding, uh, conveying the idea of, uh, I don't know, a Dutch team winning the European soccer championship. Why do you have to mention that? And, and either, either, let's say, either scenario would demand different, let's say, organization in space, uh -huh. would demand, let's say, a different perspective in space, and if all these scenarios, in a way, will fit, or could, can fit, yeah. in, in this building, in this design, this test, or this, uh, we believe that by testing it in such a way, eventually the building will work. All right, all right. And, and uh, because you have to have be, when I look at your presentation, you have to be half a, a psychologist to know what people do in certain situations. Do, do you know how to steer people? Because you had a route mm -hmm. through the Antwerp building and a route through the Hilversum building, mm -hmm. and and that's well, that what normal people will do or something like that. How mm -hmm. do you how, how do you steer people in a building? How do you let them move the way you want them to move? You want them to move? No, 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 stop, stop. You don't do that. No, we're not really? designing IKEAs. Yeah, and, and you first have to, let's say, pass uh, the cupboards, and then you have to pass uh, the linen. You don't then, do that. No, 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 no. no. I, 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 really, I, I really think it's preposterous that you would claim that you design an IKEA. So, but <laughs> there's, of course, let's say, that's the, 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 the let's say, the, the second layer of your argument is indeed that you do have to steer people. Mm -hmm. But at the other hand, you should, let's say, provide liberty, and you should always provide options, or you should provide scenarios, different scenarios. That's what's missing in IKEA, options. Yeah. Yeah, there yeah, are no scenarios. Yeah, yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, yes, we do steer people, but we, we offer them, let's say, always an escape. You can go by escalator, or by stair, or by elevator. You can take the slow route 
or you can take the direct route through an elevator. So by offering all these different scenarios again, you liberate yourself from the IKEA, and at the same time, you do, let's say, design it in such a way that the elevator is not directly vis visible, hence people take the stair, etc. Mm -hmm. So there are some tricks. And there are some tricks of the, of the master. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give him more applause. Thank you very much. It's very fascinating what you told us. Um, and, and what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, look from another perspective to the movement of people. The next speaker does that as well. Um, and she, when, when we have moved the people, or the people have moved themselves, our next speaker asks herself the question, what's next? Do we have to have rules to oblige to? What will happen if they have moved? Uh, what's the main obstacles she sees? She is for Rabobank, uh, uh, responsible for the experts in foreign countries. She's head expatriate advice and services at, I mentioned before, the Rabobank. Ladies and gentlemen, give her applause. Priscilla Bodden. is I want to share with you my life story. And I don't want to share my life story as an individual, me, Priscilla van der Linde, but I want to share with you my life story as an expert professional, the profession I like very, very much. And I will tell you about my company, Rabobank, and I will tell you about international assignments in Rabobank, and I will tell you about what keeps me and my team busy every day and share with you some cases and how it works in practice. And that's what I want to do. Uh, so, please join me at the join. First, some facts. Well, Rabobank, a little bit about myself. I started working at Rabobank about six years ago, and before that, I came from Philips, where I actually met Nanette for the first time, also in the same field. And then I moved to Rabobank, and I thought, is this a wise decision to go to Rabobank, this very, very Dutch company? And I was working in Philips, very global model mobile company, so many international employees, but there was something into it. And then, actually, for a few, uh, from me a few years ago, I really am experiencing how international this world is going to be for my company, Rabobank. But it all started in the beginning, 114 years ago, with just a bunch of farmers who needed really uh, to gather all their credit facilities. And it's really, really only from well, the late, uh, from 1980s that we first started our office, uh, our very first office in America, with our very first expat. So it's only, well, 30 years, 30, uh, 33 years. But if I see today, we have about 800 offices around the world. Uh, and I will show you some maps where we are at the moment, so you have an idea where we're strong. But it has grown so much. And we're now in 30 countries in the world with expats, but actually we are there more, many more countries uh, where people are <coughs> working for long or short uh, periods. But then about 25 years ago, they thought, okay, we cannot handle these people who are moving around the world just uh, by HR simply. So they started an expat department, and I think it was one or two people. And I have to say, the very first lady who started working in the department, she's still with, uh, with us today. And now we're today a team of 10 people um, and some other experts, and we're cooperating with our HR colleagues all around the world. Let me see for a moment. <coughs> what I wanted to share with you, because that's, I think it's very important to understand before I start talking more about assignments, is why do we actually assign experts around the world? Because there's so many, many reasons. Um, within Rabobank, I can see people who are going for career development. Very senior management are actually relocating around the world. We have corporate management training programs with very, very young people who start their career in Rabobank and their very first real job is somewhere in another country. Uh, sometimes we just need hands. 
and sometimes we go to countries where they just need our, te uh, our technical skills or our expertise. So there can, many, there can be so many reasons actually to go uh, <coughs> abroad. But, and that's also something what is uh, really start, what was really surprising for me. When I first started working in Rotterdam, it were more, oh, I think 90% of the expats or all the international Chinese, they were all Dutch people. So it was quite easy actually because well here we are as a headquarters in the Netherlands and we just have to assign those Dutch people around the, around the globe. But it's not the case anymore. We are growing our business and we the international community is growing as well. And we are spending more time actually on relocating people from Brussels to Australia and from the US to Hong Kong or whatever or from Tanzania to whatever country, then we're now focusing on our Dutch people. So we're actually becoming quite an international country. And then also in the Netherlands, our SMB population has grown so much. So when I first started, I think it was about 150 people where we, we were really managing, but at the moment we're doing 450 people uh, every year in our population. So our business has grown, <coughs> it has not grown that much. So we just have to find our ways to make it standard as much as possible, but also provide some services and uh, what our business has best for us. Just to show you, this is excluding Europe. Where are we in the world? And this is split out in our major uh, activities. It's wholesale, uh, it's more in the farming, rural, retail banking. And we have also some groups like Robeco, which also belongs to Rabobank, Development. Rebel Fast Food Group, prime, you know, formerly known as Balfons. I think it's interesting for you to know that, for example, here is our rubber development ex uh, activities. We invest quite some money in, in banking, partnering actually with banks in developing countries. So at, at the moment, we have about 20 long term experts who are in Tanzania, in Rwanda, in uh, Zambia, um, and I, I forget something, Paraguay. Uh, really working hand in hand together with developing countries to really uh, develop their banking facilities. It's a very interesting business. But basically our main business is of course in Hong Kong, in New York, in London and in Sydney because that's where the financial centers are in this world. Uh, but we, we're growing in all kinds of countries. So you can see we also have a presence in, the Netherlands, in Europe, UK of course very big and then Poland is uh, for us a very uh, growth area, Germany more, and there are lots of lots of people who are coming to the Netherlands. Because you were first talking actually about people coming from Spain, well we attract hundreds of people every year from India, from all kinds of Eastern European countries, Australia, and they're all coming to work in Rabobank, sometimes as IT uh, experts, it's, uh, it's changing really. And what is the role for my department? Well, it's so many, actually, and that makes it sometimes difficult. I have to share, I can share with you that we just did an audit of my department because we have to do that every three years. And then it made me realize that we're almost like a business in a, in a company because we have to actually design the policies. We have to execute the policies. We have to monitor compliance with policies. Um, what did I forget? There are so many different tasks we have to do we control all kind of uh, different aspects. But basically, we are, we are responsible uh, as a department for de developing policies and also executing processes and monitoring everything. We have different type of assignments. We have long-term assignments. Those are the people who go away for more than one year, uh, usually one to three years, sometimes five years, and they go from country to country to country. We have a lot of people who go on short-term uh, assignments. Those are usually people going from one month to, uh, let's say, nine months, 12 months. They go everywhere around the world. We have commuters. Those were typically people who were working between Belgium and the Netherlands and Germany and, and, and the Netherlands. But that's also interesting to see. Today, we're actually talking about people working on a commuter basis from America to the Netherlands or from America to Chile. Uh, today, we were talking uh, yeah, some very strange, big combination. So there is so much going on in the world, really, that we didn't think about a few years ago. We have the trainees, which I mentioned before. We have these people who we attract from abroad, the local hires, and then we have these people, international 
transfers in Rabobank who go with a local contract to another company with a local contract, but you also need some kind of support, and usually they come to us. But we don't do this by ourselves. We have to cooperate with Home and Host HR in all those countries because we cannot manage the world from Utrecht headquarters near Hoogte uh, So we just have to really reach out to our colleagues every day. So we start with Australia in the morning at 7 o'clock and we end with America in 11, at 11 o'clock in the evening. So our, the people working in my team, they just have to really divide their hours accordingly. Because otherwise we cannot just, we can just manage it. And that's a little bit what I explained. But it's not only the, uh, the HR we have, to work, uh, we have to work with. We also work, of course, with the business because they are strongly opinionated when it comes to the expats uh, assignments, because it's so sensitive for them, like packages we deliver, it really comes into the personal atmosphere of the family, of the expat and his or her family. So there are many people who are involved, involved at a very low level and at a very top level in the company. So if there's a question, they just ask us, and we just have to make sure that we really manage all those people in this process, including external uh, parties as well. So what keeps us busy from day to day? Well, as I just, uh, I think one of the, and before I maybe start telling about this, maybe I have to explain to you that we actually see some full process. It's the selection period, it's the start of the assignment, when we actually go on assignment, when they are there, and the end of the assignment. In the selection phase, that's getting more and more important, and especially also for a financial uh, company like ourselves. Money is not an easy thing just to decide upon. So the business, when they're going to uh, thinking about uh, sending someone abroad, they just ask us to deliver all kind of cost projections because an expert can be quite costly as most as people who might know uh, in this audience who work in this field themselves. So it takes quite a lot of effort to really make sure that we, that we have a very good and correct projection of the cost in advance so the business can make an informed decision on the package and that we can share it. <coughs> when we talk to the SME and his family, we talk about their benefits, we talk about taxes, we, do, we talk about legal consequences, we talk about cultural differences, we talk about immigration issues, safety and security, very important around the world, and also, of course, the impact on family life. And then we start actually moving them around when they go. And we have to actually reach out to the, the vendors, to the relocation providers who actually move their total household goods from the Netherlands to somewhere. And then when they are there, we have to actually manage their payrolls. And that's not so simple as it is here in the Netherlands, because we have to manage um, many times uh, abroad. And then when another part, which is very important for us, is that we have to do the salary rounds. And then when you work just here in the Netherlands, it's very easy. But we have to do that for all those people who are abroad and taking into, account, in, into, consider, into account all those different systems as well. Very important, which I think you started talking with, is of course the talent management. Because for half of our population, the reason that we sent them abroad is the talent management uh, perspective. And then again, our audit department, they ask us to, to check if people are really uh, in compliance with our policies and that's not that that we don't pay them more than that they actually should get. And they ask us to keep track of market trends and develop new policies and new processes and new instruments. And happily, we have all kinds of good benchmarking tools in the Netherlands and internationally where we can really talk to them. And we have to always provide our management with up-to-date management information because they want to know how many experts do I have, how many people are going abroad. And that's very important for their business model. What I like to tell you a little bit about is how does this really happen in practice? So I was just thinking, we have a new expert this week, and let's say his name is Eric. And Eric, he goes abroad from the Netherlands to, the, to Australia. So what happens first is that before we actually know Eric, we have this, our management, who is coming monthly together to decide upon vacancies. And they say, okay, we have a vacancy. Um, why did I say to the, oh yeah, I said from the Netherlands to the USA, in my mind, 
case. <laughs> so let's say we need a general manager in USA. So they come together, our management team, and they have all these different candidates. Probably usually there are four, three or four names. Um, and before they actually make a decision, it's not only about like, is, does this person own really fit the job, but it's also, does this family really, can, can, uh, can the family really go with this area? Uh, isn't it too expensive? Are there any blockers? Is there anything? So this is really where it comes with the pre-selection phase. We have to provide them with the cost selections. So on a monthly basis, we are very close with our talent management department to really monitor this, uh, to really monitor this pre-selection phase. Because if something goes wrong here, it's uh, through the uh, full assignment, assignment is going to be uh, very difficult. <coughs> so once the, once the selection is done, we know Eric is going. So we will invite Eric and his wife actually for a meeting. Usually wife, but nowadays sometimes also men, fortunately, and sometimes also other combinations. And we will actually discuss with them many, many subjects. It will be about the terms and benefits, but it will also be about their actual preparation, that they have to go to a tax provider to get some tax advice, but they have to take many courses as well. We send them to cultural course, language course. We, take, we send them to safety and security training, just to make sure that they're prepared and if anything is happening. We send them to our education provider to know what is happening for their children. And maybe Aaron's wife will also go to a cultural <coughs> training. And they have to really actually uh, prepare everything themselves. And then we send them abroad. And then again, uh, we manage all this day-to-day -day, uh, questions they might have. And sometimes they are very easy, but sometimes they are very big questions. And sometimes uh, unforeseen things happen. People die on assignment. People, uh, there are wrong things on assignment. There are like, everything is happening in the world. Uh, sometimes things don't go, uh, don't go well with the children. Sometimes people get promotion. Those are the celebrations. Uh, it's all these kind of things that keeps us busy during this end of assignment, during the assignment. When Eric comes back, we have to decide if he's going to a next assignment or that we have a job for him again in the Netherlands. And that's also not an easy thing uh, today. And I think many companies are already struggling with that because no job is guaranteed anymore. And that's really changed also our, uh, our life. Um, so we might be involved actually with transferring Eric to Hong Kong, but we might also be involved with actually uh, a termination uh, of Eric's job in the Netherlands eventually. So that, or we might be involved, of course, in a situation that he gets a promotion to a better, uh, to a better job. So that's a little bit what comes to my uh, day and my team's day. And the last things I have for you that I wanted to share with you a little bit around about. This, maybe this is just an overview of the countries we have. And here you can see about our uh, demographics, because this is really changing as well. What I wanted to show you is that like the long-term experts, those are the experts who go for more than one year, you can see, you really see a strong division between male and female. It's just strongly male uh, determined and females only 9%, but our younger generation, the people who go on uh, traineeships or short terms, you can really see it's changing uh, in the demographics as well. And the same accounts for age, where we have usually our experts who are in the middle brackets, the younger ones who go on the short terms uh, and the traineeships is all in the younger age brackets. So these are the things which are all changing in this, uh, in this time really. Uh, where we, are, where we are at. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, just, I was just looking for, um, for a picture. Let's see. Do you know, this is Judy Dent. Do you know her? No. She's is M. Work? She's M from James Bond. Oh. <laughs> like, you're just like M from James Bond. You decide on who's gonna get an assignment or not, and who is really capable of the job or not. That's actually what you do, don't you? For uh, some part. No, For no, some no. part. Yeah. <laughs> and, and who's Q then? But okay. Yeah. That's nice. We decide by chocolates. Yeah, 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 right. But but what I was 
wondering because uh, Eric is, is 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 a guy I like. Um, what what kind? Because you you said some uh, or questions he asks, but what, what can you give an example of of um, frequently asked questions like like what he really is trying to 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 right. cope with? I think first of all, really at the beginning, it's always about the package. I mean, it's always about the money, to be very honest. Really? Yeah. It's about, always about the money. That's what it starts. Do we have enough money to live our life abroad? All right. So, mm. And is that the right question to ask? It's just a question. Yeah, but then... <laughs> but it's, it's an important question because for our senior management population, and that's like half of our population, they already know that they are at the right track. So yeah. from a career perspective, they know, okay, if I'm going, this will be really uh, further in my career. So that's uh, already in the box. So then they just really want to know what's, what's going to happen financially to me and to my family. And often, of course, the, like the partners of experts, they have to give up their jobs still nowadays. And if yeah. they go to New York, they might be fair, they can't really work. But if they go to uh, Rwanda, they cannot work. I mean, so it will have a financial impact on them. Yes, but, but the, the thing is, it is very uh, uh, good that you say that because um, yes, that has a financial impact, mm. but it has a, 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 a social impact as well. Social if your impact. wife can't work, yeah, so that's what we're she talking divorce about. Divorce you in three years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why did my wife that happens? Be divorced? <laughs> so, 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 is is that something you cope with? Are you trying to get out of it? Because you said, well, we got to interview them. But do you interview the wife as well before you decide who's going? No. Yeah, Why don't you do that? Because it's a very difficult topic to really uh, touch upon. But, but if, he, if, if Eric is going into a divorce, yeah, he's so not really good for <laughs> the rabble bark at that moment. It ha that's why it happens, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know anything yeah, about yeah. this. But I was like, if I would decide, on three persons, I would like to spend some time with the wife as well. Yeah, that's good. So, in some businesses, we really do, and uh, so I think some of our business managers actually uh, try to get an understanding of the, of the personal life of the expats and about their families. Too. Or is it better just to send out single men? Then <laughs> <laughs> no, they get all married and mixed up uh, with. Uh, oh yeah, they, 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 they never come back. <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't what, think so. What's what's what is what is the biggest uh, and I don't want to put this in a negative perspective, but just in, in risk analysis, because you you spend lots lots of money on expatriates. What's the biggest risk for Eric in what was it? UK was it or United States? US, US. US. Yeah. What's his biggest risk yeah. of not completing the task for Amazon? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think in the end, then, uh, since, and, that, and that's really different to a few years ago. When coming back to the Netherlands, it will be really more difficult for him to really get a job. Really? Mm -hmm. Aha. So he comes back as a seasoned man uh -huh. in the United States and then there's no job here. I mean, it, it's really about performance, of course, and completing your job. That, there's the, I mean, it's really picking up your, your life, your career, your family with you. And then, well, there is some, some pressure, of course, that you really have to perform well. Because why else would be otherwise send these very expensive people abroad? So if it's not really going well, yeah, it's not always very easy to come back really, really? and to really it's, start up again. It's a it's a, it's it's a daunting task for you, and you're a little bit like Anne from James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really see that. Why can't I? Don't know if I could send you another assignment, <laughs> sir. You want to ask yeah, a question? Sure, question. So you have about 450 uh, people. How many people in your department do you support those? We have for 10 people. Yeah. And people and then there of course we have a lot of support of our HR in other countries but we don't have a like in-house. Right, so you have everything here and then uh, we have a centralized function HR. but we cooperate on a daily basis with HR. Example, Sorry? We, are, we outsource, yeah. But so we also have a lot of in-source services. We don't uh, outsource everything. But like culture courses, culture class or language training or tax advice or all those things, they're all outsourced, of course. The relocation, immigration, as much as possible. Not all immigration, I have to say, it depends on the situation. Okay. Why do you want to ask? Because you're writing down all yeah, the numbers. Uh, well, I'm interested just to hear some ratios. What kind of yeah. work do you do? 
So same same for yeah, where? Uh, with, uh, Accenture. Ah, Accenture. And you yeah. send away many people as. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. So how many people do you have? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she wants to benchmark that as well. Yeah. Uh, It's just the two of you. Now, how, how many people? How many people are you? Um, I would say about um, 350, and then extended, you know, with some with some other people, and about 500 people. Yeah. And, and what's uh, what do you think of the biggest risk for Eric? What would your answer be? Trying to give them a network yeah, of them, right. themselves yeah. if, if yeah. they would like. But I think that's the difference also because we are like a very small company still, I think, in, uh, with, uh, if you consider the number of assignments. Yeah. And I think you can have a much better networks if you're like a big uh, company with a lot of uh, international students. Yeah, well, there's the, one interesting thing about this. The numbers are very high, but the thing is, it's always, it's always about that one family or that mm -hmm. one person. Mm -hmm. And it's very impactful. Yeah. And our leadership sometimes. <laughs> Get me That's called World, World Citizens at Work. And we're going to click on that. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, then it's, please come forward, take the, the, the blue microphone. Because what is this? Um, well, I was very happy with the contributions of both speakers. Because, first of all, Michiel talked about a map that you have to draw for your own career. And I think that's essential because that sort of guides you to what you want to do. And then Priscilla, of course, points it out that if people go abroad, they have to understand if they are really a world citizen, how they really, and not just them, but also their family, if you want to avoid happy wife, just mention parties in general. Yeah. In an <laughs> audience like this, that could be a life save. But if you have a family going abroad, or people going abroad, and their partners going abroad, you want to know, can you manage abroad? Are you the right person to work abroad? We have different scenarios, and this is a simple version. And this is online, you can check this, this anytime. Um, yes, um, we have more countries. We have a scenario with the BRIC countries, which is not online. So Brazil, China, India, Russia. 
Uh, we have a birthday scenario. How do you celebrate birthdays in different countries? Yes, where that came from. Um, but I'll, I'll show you a little bit uh, about China. And, well, are you able to do a deal in China? All right. This is made for entrepreneurs. All right. Let's, let's see. The, this is so, a scenario. What's yeah. the scenario? The scenario is wining and dining in China. Um, those of you who've been to China know food is extremely important uh, for the Chinese people. Your company has sent you to China to strike a deal. You're not going to work there. You just have to deliver a signed contract in the end. You've been to China for three times, and you're here again. Your boss, you work for an international firm. You have an American boss, and he wants you to come back with a signed contract. And this is a tough boss. It's a tough boss. Yes. It needs to be a signed contract. Mm, Otherwise, right. your right. job might no longer be guaranteed. Mm. And it's your final evening in China, so what are you going to do? Well, um, you have three choices. You're feeling really the pressure from your boss and you think, I have to make it work. So I'll just bring the contract to the dinner and I'm going to make it, try and get it signed, but I know I can't push <coughs> too much with the Chinese because that's just not going to work. Your second option is, I'm just going to enjoy the dinner, all the various sort of tastes that come by, I'll just sit around the table that turns and I'll take my pick from every dish that comes by. Uh, I'll do the karaoke if I have to dance and sing on stage. I'll just do it, whatever it takes. And I'll just build confidence and hope that when I return to my desk on Monday, I'll find a signed contract in my inbox. Or you work for an American company I mentioned. Option three, you just think, bring the contract and I'll suggest I pay the bill. No worries, Chinese people. I'll just pay the bill for you. So, so we're not going to do the answer right now. No. no. So you, uh, you we are going to send you for the break. But think about answer one, two, or three. And when we return, you have to make a choice in your head, and then we'll decide which one is the best. All right. I'll uh, leave you for 20 minutes. We'll have some drinks and coffee. And we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, well, it, it's very good that, that you keep on speaking with each other because uh, this is all about networking, so it's good that you do that. But um, we had a question for you before the break. So, Nadine, please come forward because uh, what I just would like to do is just to check who says what. So, uh, if you've, you've all, all thought about which answer you want to give. The first answer was, well, I, I feel pressure from my boss. I take the, the, I want to make the deal happen during dinner. I know I can't push it. It doesn't work with the Chinese, but I try as well. Um, who goes for answer number one? Two people. Three people. Three people. Sir, why do you choose that one? Because you, you will never adapt, just be yourself then. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. And, 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 and <laughs> Miss, you, you said answer number one as well. It takes you a long time, so sometimes you just have to cut it. All right, you've never been to China, but there, but there must be one time. Uh, who said, sir, the glasses, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. if you don't push it, you'll never get ahead. That, if you do push it, you'll never get ahead. All right. Then answer number two. Uh, this is the most fun part, actually. I'll enjoy the dinner, eat everything, do the karaoke, and uh, we'll, I'll hope that everything will end up well. Who, who takes number two? Who does the karaoke? Oh, we have karaoke lovers in the audience. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, um, Two gentlemen, did you you did a karaoke, yeah? Uh, yeah, many times. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and are you good at it or not? Yeah, excellent singers. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, even in the Netherlands, you choose the karaoke. Yeah. So, what, why why did you choose number two? It's a cultural thing. It's, it's you don't push Chinese. You let, it's, it's a relationship uh, thing that you work on. And, and to have a good meal, food is everything in China. And then afterwards, having fun with, with the Chinese, be one of them. 
But, but you have an American boss who says, if you don't come back with a contract, your head will be on a plate. That's why he doesn't go himself, but he's never going to All right, all right, all right. Go, yeah. Uh, number three, I want to need to make this deal tonight, or I'll impress my counterpart, I'll pay the bill. Who is so generous? Who, who does that? Number three, who votes for number three? <laughs> no, uh, we're Dutch. Yeah, we're Dutch. Uh, you're, an, you're an American now. Who votes for number three? Nobody votes for number three. <laughs> I'll pay my own court. But, uh, okay. <laughs> not yours. No. Uh, no, this. What should we choose? What's the right answer? Well, going Dutch is definitely not the right answer. No? So don't split the bill. Don't even try to pay it. It's not going to work either. Um, go, I, number two, you're all perfect China lovers. You will all be able to close the deal. Just enjoy the karaoke. Um, you have, in, most of you might not know it, but the, the person you asked the question to Renz, so why would you do the karaoke? I know, I don't know your karaoke skills, Nirk, but I know you've been many times to China and have lived for a long time in India, and those countries Food is everything, pushing a deal is never going to work, it's all about relations. So answer two is the best answer. Alright, but, but I, I just, I'm just curious, because uh, uh, some people said, well, it's, it sometimes takes so long that, come on, let's get it over with. How do we deal with that then? Don't plan a trip for two days, plan a trip for a week or two. Plan a trip for a week or two, oh, that sounds good. So, yes, sir. Four Ps, patience, perseverance, politeness, Oh wow, well, we're gonna write that down as well. Happy life, happy wife, and... <laughs> I've learned something at the end of this day. But and, and how, how, do you, how do you know this wisdom? How, how do you come up with that? I've just been in the last And, 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 and well, perseverance is very, very important, but patience is very important. But if you're a very impatient person, like a Dutchman, <laughs> Don't go there. Someone else Really? And lock yourself in the... All right, all right. Okay. Um, and not it for you, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's very important to realize this is not a wisdom game. It's about thinking about other cultures, understanding how people do things differently. And sometimes we have... We won't show you that, but we have a second question here where two answers out of the three are, in fact, correct because there's not always, with cultures, only one correct answer. The whole idea of the game is to make people think about their own culture and the culture they're going to visit and how that interaction works. And somebody said something very true. How will a Chinese person perceive it? Because sometimes you go to a country and they expect you to be the rude, direct, very a uh, forceful foreigner. Where is that? Uh, you might be surprised if you're looking for a job in, say, Japan. They expect you to just present yourself, phone up, say, hi, I'm in the country, can I come by tomorrow? And they'll love that. Whereas the Japanese are, have a very strong uh, culture, very strong sense of culture, but yeah. they know that Westerners are never going to be able to adapt to that culture. They're never going to learn it. So yes, let's treat them as something exotic and be different. <laughs> All right, right. Uh, well, very um, uh, types of race. Uh, uh, it's uh, well, th there are nuances everywhere. That's what I wanted to say. Um, um, we can all do this test online. World yeah. citizens at work. Google yeah, that on your website. Yeah, or via our website, World Citizens at Work. All right. Well, I'm um, very intrigued by all the answers. I think questions. Joseph, one of the scenarios online. Next week, all of them again? Sure, Monday. Monday, <laughs> Joseph going to put all the scenarios Monday. So Monday after weekend, then, uh, then we'll do that. Thank you very much, Nanette. No, Thank you very much, Joseph. <laughs> Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we, we are going to continue <coughs> the program. Uh, we've spoken about how to send people away. We've spoken about, uh, uh, well, how to move them. And the, the, what we're actually going to do is, is turn that question 180 degrees. 
we are going to ask the question how to attract talent, how to get them over here. Uh, the German government actually has many offices around the world to attract foreign scientific talent to become a researcher at German universities. The institute is called DAT. And you can ask yourself, why does the, the German uh, government uh, uh, tries to attract so many foreign scientists in, in a world that well, is pretty economic challenging times? So why do they have money for that? Why do they do that? Uh, our next speaker is going to answer that question. She is, um, uh, well, she is uh, 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 linked to that. Um, she's trying to attract top scientists in Asia, in Jakarta, to come to Germany. We are very pleased that she's here because she came all the way from Jakarta. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very glad that she's here. Uh, Dr. Irene Jansen. Thank you very much and congratulations to 20 years of labor mobility. I just realized this morning that I was a living example of 20 years of labor mobility after three continents and four different countries in the last 20 years. Um, I'm quite used to sort of changing perspectives and having to deal with human resource officers and um, everything that's been uh, talked about. I will talk about um, the, a very con conventional definition of mobility. This is about mobile academics um, who play an important role in our day and life. What we need to understand is that those mobile academics, students, professors, just like those executives, uh, the Rabobank says, they go places because they expect to be able to grow. They hope to win something from the experience. So we might have a little dilemma here because on the one hand, we keep inviting them. They come by you know, great numbers. On the other hand, we are promising that we can help them grow, um, but our systems are rather overextended. A lot of challenges that we haven't met in our own countries. So while we are inviting them and promising a lot, the question is, uh, do we have the skills, do we have the human resources to actually keep our promises? Over 3.3 talented students, a number that has grown by 65% in just one decade, is on the move. Those wandering scholars expect that the international experience adds value to their professional and academic development. And for all, the, all we know, the uh, most immediate concern is to be employable on an increasingly global, very competitive market. With 245,000 international students in the fall of 2010, that's about 11% of all students in Germany, Germany is one of the uh, leading destinations for, in for international students. Until 2020, we want even more, that is 300,000 international students. Now let me describe how difficult the situation is. The rector of the University of Duisburg, Essen, not very far across uh, the border, claims that he is in need of additional space, a minimum of 30,000 um, 30, square meters. I couldn't help, couldn't resist the temptation. That's four soccer fields. <laughs> um, in 2010, he had 4,500 first year students. In 2011, he had 7,300, and until 2015, 3,300 more study places are actually needed. For the time being, the rector has rented um, movie theaters that function as lecture halls. Now, Germany's Lenda, in this case, North Rhine-Westphalia, they're in charge of the universities, and they seem to be unable to help. They cannot cope with the situation not so much for financial restraints, because of, but because of constitutional restraints. They may not invest in universities, except for research. Um, now, North Rhine-Westphalia's budget was even declared unconstitutional because it wanted to borrow more than it invested. 
So in 2011, Dusseldorf, the capital, was helped by the other federal states with 260 million euro. And the problem is here to stay. Not until 2045, as the center of research in Germany claimed, will student numbers go back to where they were in 2005. Now, given the financial constraints, the universities are also not able to pay competitive salaries. Germany comes number 10 in terms of professorial uh, salaries, right after the Netherlands, I believe. Meanwhile, 7.5 million people in Germany can hardly read and write, and 60,000 pupils, I checked it, it's the size of the town of Horn in the Netherlands, quit school before graduation. Furthermore, I quote, Europe has lurched from uh, one economic crisis to another in recent months, and any long-term solution will depend on the willingness of Germany to shoulder much of the financial burden the debt crisis has created, as I shall be recently observed in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Yet, I shall be goes on, the Germans remain willing to generously subsidize others from much further afield, foreign students. So, should Germany just give up? on recruiting and subsidizing. Many critics from outside and inside the system have recently drawn our attention to, um, the, um, to the fact that internationalization is or potentially might be counterproductive to many of the course anyway, that it increases injustice and inequality, erosion of local languages elsewhere, and further falling behind of developing countries. Yet, in spite of all the challenges and uh, intimidations, Germany does not seem to be bowing to the pressure and has indeed shown an amazingly strong conviction that supporting international mobility is worth a substantial investment and that the universities need to deliver. Germany claims that the investment is worthwhile because internationalization of higher education institutions helps to maintain and enhance quality of academic institutions and thus the education at home so it's in the interest of the taxpayer where does that very strong conviction come from number one the u.s and the western european countries have helped post-war germany to get back on its feet europeanization has allowed the country to adopt a new national identity after World War II. Number two, export has made Germany's economy strong. Going international has been Germany's growth engine and quality engine. Furthermore, number three, Germany seems convinced that money follows talent much more than talent follows money. So that it, that, uh, having a talented international, whatever, academic community actually uh, counteracts unemployment. So the conviction is there and very strong. Which action is now taken to meet the challenges that I've described earlier? How are these overextended, underfinanced universities coping with it? One decision they have been making is no fees. Fundamentally, Germany still holds forward that internationalization strategy centers around the idea of a common good and improving the overall academic quality. So Germany has ruled out tuition like Scotland, which we can read, um, Scotland is deprived of 117.5 million US dollars a year in lost revenue just from EU students who also get free education as well. Unlike Sweden, that has decided not to be deprived any longer in charge fees. So, in addition to that action, no fees, another action was decided upon, which is spending even more money. Public money, for one thing. The government budget has been increased by 9.11 billion euro between 2011 and 2015 to ease the burden of the double cohorts entering the German universities because we've 
changed our school system from 13 to two years and given up on the Bundeswehr. Um, so that, of course, implies the danger of not as many international students being admitted, given that the universities are pretty crowded as it is. In addition to government spending, a lot of private monies go into the system. Um, in order to attract more and highly qualified university staff, financial incentives have been given by private foundations like the Krupp Stiftung. Professors go where the money is. So every returning um, professor gets 100,000 euro right there. And during the last six years, 52 international researchers could be lured back to Germany under this scheme. And then there's money from publicly funded agencies. The Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, they claim they want to reach the world stars of science, as their uh, uh, president said, it gives five million for five years to a scientist of that caliber when he or she is ready to come back to Germany. And furthermore, DID and the Stifterverband, um, they give 50 years in, um, in as an award, as a prize to the university that has the best uh, service facilities for international students and faculty. In addition to spending monies and not claiming fees, a lot has been done in terms of adjusting legal frameworks, ease visa regulations and work permits, so that those graduates, may they be international or national, can e more easily find jobs. And also adjusting academic frameworks um, you might have heard about the embarrassing uh, doctoral awards, so that whole system of awarding a doctoral degree has been revised or is under revision. Admission reform, although lagging behind terribly, and then the excellence initiative that you might have heard also falls under this. And then last but not least, the universities have mandated an organization that I represent here to support them in their internationalization initiatives, the DAAD, Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst. So, um, the DID alone spends about 400 million euro annually, taxpayers' money, on internationalization of German universities, mostly in mobility. The global gauge ranking by the British Council scores high. They've compared various countries in terms of their internationalization policy. So um, they said thanks to its internationalization strategy, which actively promotes mobility in both direction and um, a lot of funding, um, and that Germany has committed itself to a proactive internationalization strategy and a balanced policy framework, they've picked picked up points all over, uh, according to them, and have given us a first rank here. So, um, we've been quite successful in this, and I won't, you don't have to learn this by heart, I understand this will be uploaded and you can go into the details. What I wanted to show here is um, how does the DID claim these funds? We're not a government agency. Nobody gives these funds to us just like that because it's written in some uh, constitution. So how, we, how do we do this? Um, we actually, the DID centers around three uh, strategy areas. And um, the main target areas, the three areas, are also related to the main <coughs> sponsoring ministries where the money comes from. The first is the area of uh, cultural politics, mainly targeted at the Foreign Office. So we design our individual programs, such as, um, such as uh, alumni programs or re-invitation programs for former alumni, around a certain strategic uh, goal that we define. So by Presenting the tools and the goals, we make it sort of transparent to the funding agencies or the ministries who don't really know um, too much about higher education and internationalization. We try to make transparent what it is we do and have actually been pretty successful in securing funds even in tight, so under tight uh, fiscal circumstances. Our funds have actually been growing. 
the, the, the second uh, strategic area is uh, developing politics. Um, just to give you an example of figures since now I'm in, in Indonesia, within the last five years, for instance, DID financed 86 completed PhDs in German, of Indonesians in Germany, while the Indonesian ministry financed 235. So, um, quite a lot of things can be done with this money, and it all breaks down those programs into certain country strategies, and it's all very transparent, which is important. And the next strategy concerns university um, policy. <coughs> Same thing here, we design, sorry, we decide on certain <coughs> tools, we do lobbying, whatever needs to be done, and uh, make sure that they understand the strategy behind it. Now this geostrategic approach, the, the favorable diversity of students, for instance, that the Global Gage pointed out, is gave us credit for, uh, didn't really happen by chance. Some of this development, of course, uh, is due to the strong presence of former Eastern Bloc countries. It's um, related to world politics. And um, a lot is related to scholarship and course design, allocation of money, and geostrategic decisions made by the DID. While, as a rule, we work with all foreign countries, we do sometimes encourage mobility to certain regions. For instance, with programs like Go East for Central and Eastern Europe, or A New Passage to India, or Study and uh, Language in China, to come up with a, a, a well-balanced geostrategic uh, policy. Um, before the DID raises funds, it needs, of course, ask, needs to ask the university what it is they want. And the university, because we are owned, if you like, legally speaking, by the German universities, not by the government. So when you ask the universities, like here, they all say Asia. We're living in the Asian century. So looking at Indonesia, Germany is, in fact, the biggest and most important um, hub for Indonesian students in Europe. But figures, if you look behind this, are shriveling. Um, fast, and it will be up, you know, uh, for a person like me now to look into why this is and do something against it. I think one homework that the DID hasn't quite um, uh, made yet is the DID as a national agency and the DID as a European agency administering the Erasmus Mundus and European programs do cohabit, but that is where the relationship ends at this point. And I think the next step we'll have to go is uh, uh, go beyond national borders and see how we deal with uh, Europe. Um, last but not least, creating more diversity and open-mindedness at home is a big policy issue. Uh, so we have a big campaign for going out. Meanwhile, 30% of our students do actually go out already, but we want this to be 50%. And with this last file, I'll try again, but unfortunately, the little, um, this little penguin doesn't say, oh, sorry, no, I killed it. Um, so anyway, the, this is a go out campaign, see something else. It says, mal was anderes sehen. Um, a little penguin is to come out to hop out of the jungle, um, sort of. Uh, a good example of me, the penguin living in the Batavian jungle at this point. Thank you very much. And there, there might be some people who want to ask some questions because some people are from the Erasmus University, so maybe you have something in mind like a question or not really yet. No. <laughs> just, just ask anybody else. Already, um, yeah, um, there's one. Uh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah. yeah you said uh, the money for the Yes to both questions, and there are very able people here in the yeah. audience that might be able to uh, enlighten you on what the Netherlands do. Yeah. Uh, excellent programs, very experienced, very similar, and we exchange views actually uh, regularly. 
Um, and yes, we do tracer studies and keep records of um, how our alumni are doing, and we have a lot of programs to keep in touch with those you know, foreign students who once got their PhD here, and now they go back to their countries or other countries, in fact. And we also try to establish regional networks for them, because we do understand that they might have done their PhD in Cologne, but now they're you know, 20 years later, and they need to maybe network with the Netherlands for something. So we quite encourage that, and, or with uh, you know neighboring Asian countries. So um, yes, we do keep track, and we do encourage them to. We help them if they want to have a seminar, set up a seminar of their own in, let's say, water management, and want to invite, let's say, a Dutch colleague who happens to be in the neighboring country. Yes, they can do that, and we could give them money. Um, so we trace that, but we also learn a lot about how we develop, uh, how we. Uh, the international world of academia is actually developing very important for us. But, but if you give um, uh, a scientist that kind of money because because he can organize something, why does that help German universities? Well, we, we do believe that um, the scientists uh, will stay in touch with us uh, simply by being part of that network and, be, and talking to us. So that opens doors that opens opportunities, let's say, for a German water management scientist who might find it extremely attractive to see the chaos in Jakarta with his own eyes and uh, figure out what could be done there, could be done there. Okay, so, so there's not a direct uh, 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 benefit, of investment. but, but it's, it's because you open up the network, you think, well, we have to have, we, we can have our talent go out there as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah interestingly enough, I, I know Switzerland has done this, Germany never uh, had a survey of how much those international students actually spend in Germany, which uh -huh. would actually be quite interesting to know. It might be a powerful tool when it comes to raising money. We've never bothered to actually figure that out. Mm -hmm. It's really more about this indirect return of investment in yeah. terms of an international science community. Th there was one thing I, I wrote down, and I tweeted actually, money follows talent more than talent follows money. That's correct, isn't yes. it? And three sentences later, you said, "Professor, go where the money is." <laughs> so how 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 do I match that? Yes, you caught me there. I think it's wrong. <laughs> um, I was talking about the younger talent. Oh, yes. younger talent. Yes. <laughs> All right. If you're older, you go for the money. No, actually, I think in terms of macroeconomics, if you look at it that way, um, professors would. Um, would, it, it, yeah, money goes where talent is. You know, production sites needs intelligent, young, well-educated, like young engineers, otherwise they can't build their, um, their planet there. Mm -hmm. But I do see a little problem. <laughs> All right, right, right. And, and uh, we, because we talked at, at the beginning, why, how, because that's what ELM is about, how to attract and bind international talent. What would you, your top three be? how to attract them and how to bind them to your institution, company, country. What would, you, would your top three be like? At the end of the day, it is about quality. Your country needs a reputation. The mm -hmm. university system needs a decent reputation. Otherwise, you won't really be able to attract them. But, um, for instance, whether it's cheap or expensive, that that is a totally different um, Thing. And it depends on whom you're talking to, uh, whether that is uh, to decide whether that is good or bad. From the ISB, where I met uh, Ned, is something we have completely underestimated, but Eric, you pointed it out. Um, security, it's very important for those um, mobile academics, the wandering scholars. Um, will I be able to safely do my research there? Will I be discriminated against? Will I have to fear about my family? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, treating people decently, um, being open-minded and accepting that they bring something, that they want to grow and that we accept them that way. Um, so that requires we need to invest in the quality of what we offer them. I do think that the rumor spreads and that that is very important. And the reputation then is very important. Yeah, I can help Irene out uh, because um, as some of you might know at the AIA, for those who don't know, forget about the word, in Dublin we'll be presenting a book from the German government, which Archie, one of my colleagues, is writing right now about what attracts international students to Germany. 
So that's going to be other bedsides from yeah, bedside the month. Reading. All right, bedside reading. Thank you very much, Irene yeah. Janssen. Thank you. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to the last speaker of today. Um, the, the, uh, I, I would like to quote Thomas Friedman on this one. The world is becoming flatter and flatter. He, he wrote a, a brilliant book about the world is flat, and, and we see that all around us. Here in Rotterdam, uh, we've become a melting pot of mobility. More than 100 nationalities are here together on a few square kilometers. And, and the question is, if that mobility is so great, so um, mature maybe, um, how do we cope with all these individuals? How do we communicate? How do we, do we want them to assimilate to our local customs? Or, or as the Japanese say, well, he's an exotic, let's treat him as an exotic. That's, that's a question we would like to answer. And the thing is, we, we found somebody who does that in day, on daily basis, but from a very different perspective, as you may uh, uh, think of. He is working with all these nationalities. He is he's thinking about how to treat those nationalities because he is a doctor. He's a professor at the Erasmus Medical Center here in Rotterdam. It's very close by. He has patients with heart failure, diabetes, and he has found a way to communicate and work with them on a very innovative way. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a very warm welcome, Professor Dr. Erik Seymans. for this uh, kind uh, introduction. I hope I can live up uh, to the expectations after this. Uh, you make my presentation much more difficult. I have prepared uh, a much more simple uh, presentation as announced. Um, and, but one thing uh, you will write, here you see the Architecture uh, Institute, and here you see the Erasmus Medical Center. This is the third largest hospital of uh, Europe and as you will notice immediately I am one of the 15,000 people working there my own mobility towards this event was rather limited two minutes so that's not something to impress you with and what this presentation will be about uh, I want to talk about the problems that labor mobility brought to my daily work. And I'm actually, I'm not to the folks of ELM, I'm not complaining about labor mobility, not at all. But uh, it, it really made our work uh, much more difficult. But then I also want to talk about the solutions we came up with, and we are currently implementing them. And they will have effects on the mobility of the patient when the patient wants to meet his or her physician. And I will mainly talk about diabetes mellitus. And that's because diabetes is the, the, the largest healthcare problem of the present day. So it's important you, you, if you have diabetes, you are at risk for cardiovascular disease, for kidney failure, uh, heart failure, uh, cancer, almost everything you can think of. Now, this is really a problem, and it's growing and growing. It's almost uh, uh, epidemic uh, size in our population. I will come back to that later. Of course, I'm used to talk to uh, biomedical scientists and uh, to physicians, and this is a completely different uh, audience. It might be that I still added uh, real medical slang Please interrupt me immediately. <laughs> I like that most because actually I'm used to it at home. I'm continuously interrupted. <laughs> so, please interrupt me immediately. Ask your questions and not worry. Save them for after the presentation. I would like to keep you all on board during the presentation. And I will answer all these questions during my presentation. But you probably get more. Innovation. We need innovation desperately in healthcare. And today we are treating our patients more and more with high-tech approaches and much more aggressively than we used. We can cure much more disorders than 10 years ago. But it comes with a price. 
for instance, we pay the price of very dangerous, difficult to treat, opportunistic infections. So we need uh, a new construction of our hospital. Although we face large budget cuts in the coming years, we decided to invest in this construction. We need patients being in one room, one room per patient. That will prevent the spread of these very, very dangerous infections. Our hospital uh, will be built on the same spot. It will be smaller, so we will have less beds in the new hospital, meaning that we need to speed up curing these patients, having less complicated infections. That's one step ahead if you do not experience an infection during your admittance to the ward. I can send you earlier back to home. Uh, it looks like we're building a huge, very expensive hospital, but actually we think that we can make a profit out of it. Another example is the resistance to antibiotics of certain bacteria. And this uh, stuff aureus can be resistant to penicillin, which makes its treatment, when you are infected with it, much more expensive and also less successful. More people die when you are resistant, when you are infected by resistant death. But the other problem, the problem for our hospital is that when there's an MRSA infection on our ward, we need to close the ward, wait until all patients are gone, clean the ward. The approximate cost of this expedition is, on average, 70,000 euro. So one infection with MRSA, you know, 70,000. Now I think that the um, new building is uh, a very smart economic move. But there are other reasons to change the hospital as well. This is how uh, my uh, outpatient uh, desk looked 10 years ago. I was writing these secret things about my patients. Like this, not telling them what I was writing. And they accepted it all. They thought, well, this is the physician. He knows what he's doing. We sit here, he's, he's not watching us. He's not paying attention to me, the patient. I'm paying him, but he's not looking at me at all. So that was the situation 10 years ago. And of course, we could have continued working this way, but we thought, let's try it in a different way. And today, the view of the patient at my desk is this. The patient can look at the medical file, which is a, a screen in the table. I work on it. I make lots of typos, so uh, the patient says, well, you're going to typo again. It's, uh, it's all wrong. And then, when the corrected file is there, we go through the uh, laboratory results and the discussion about it. And it works like this. Here you see a patient with diabetes and kidney failure in the last stage, really very sick person. I don't know if you can see him like this, but, but look closely. I put it in a loop. What is happening? Do you see what's happening here? Interaction. There is more interaction, but what's happening? He's very, very much involved. Yes. And not a passive uh, waiting. Exactly. Actually, what they were doing in the past, they were complaining about you, that I was not paying attention, not looking at them. Let's turn around. The patient has, is not paying attention to me. <laughs> He's only working with his file. In the research, we, we've noticed that um, self-management, being the manager of your own disease, being the manager of your own disease, results in much better outcome. 
then when the grey haired old doctor says to you, you don't even need to do this and that, if you manage your disease yourself, that works much finer. Why did I choose diabetes? Diabetes is a disorder <coughs> of the carbohydrate. <coughs> you have a shortage of insulin, which causes your glucose to rise in your blood. So hyperglycemia. And the hyperglycemia causes all these complications. I mentioned on the first slide. It's a huge problem at the population level. 900,000 persons in the Netherlands have pre-diabetes. 800,000 of, of the persons have diabetes already. We estimated that between 30 and 50 percent of the patients are not diagnosed yet. So we have unidentified patients with a severe disease walking around without knowing that they are having diabetes. On a yearly basis, we approximately in the Netherlands diagnose 9% new patients with diabetes, although in Rotterdam it's 12. Right, what exactly is pre-diabetes? Is that somebody with symptoms of diabetes or something Now, uh, it can be with symptoms, uh, but the symptom is like obesity. Um, we call it, uh, another name for it is metabolic syndrome. There are many names for uh, uh, disorders that we grouped into this group of patients with a kind of pre-diabetes. Actually, you are producing more insulin, your pancreas is doing its <coughs> very best, and you are compensating all other susceptibility to diabetes. And at a certain point in time, the <coughs> large part of this group, this compensation mechanism will fail. And then you are a part of this group of 9% stepping over to this group. Why would Rotterdam have a higher percentage? I come back to that question to you. Okay, then. Next slide. Very good question. When we diagnose diabetes, already 50% has chronic complications. So we are experts in being too late in this discussion. And the total health expenditure is two billions. But the real cost to our economy, to our society, are much higher. Back to the Erasmus Medical Center, very close by, two minutes from here, we look at the patients with diabetes 8.6 times yearly. But in all other hospitals, 80 hospitals of the Netherlands, including the other university hospitals, they only look 1.7 times. So there's no problem at all. Erasmus MC is just completely innocent. What do you think? Why are we looking so often to these patients? It has to do with something I told you in the beginning. I think we are too late in our population to do that. I would like it. Now it has to do with the size of our population. We are a university hospital for 4.3 million people. And we have a much stronger selection of the most severe cases. So we are looking only at end stage disease. All these patients almost 87% already had at least one mild heart infarction. You will never find a population like this in any other hospital in Europe. It has to do with the strong selection towards output. Um, but there's another reason, and you are close by. Can you, can you come up with another reason? It's the same as uh, why the growing prevalence is so high in Rotterdam. I think it would have to do with Yes. Exactly. It has to do with this. We have a very, very intercultural society. At our outpatient clinic, 17% of the patients hardly speak Dutch. They speak altogether 
168 languages. And I like to speak languages, although I'm not that good at it. And the problem is that the patients mainly speak languages I do not, uh, I'm not very good at all. <laughs> so it's Chinese, it's Moroccan, Turkish. So they're facing a problem there. We're trying to treat them very well. They take a translator with them. We have translators, but they don't, know, do not, don't want to use it. It's not personal to them. And then we talk to them. Don't know what what has been translated. They leave, and year after year they have the same results. We give them medication. The, the results are fully uh, <coughs> treated diabetes, which is totally unacceptable. So that's that's a real problem for uh, 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 the uh, Rotterdam population. These persons, cat, compared to Caucasian patients, they get diabetes at a much younger, level, younger age when they are less overweight. And when they have, it's a much more severe disorder. So these are the persons we should communicate best with. with it's impossible. Do you see our solution, or at least part? This is my virtual diabetologist, diabetologist 2.0. As he talked German or talked Turkish to you. Willkommen bei der Diabetes Messstation in Erasmus MC. Geben Sie zuerst Ihre Patientennummer und den Bestätigungscode ein. Wählen Sie danach die Messungen, die Sie ausführen möchten. My diabetologist 2.0 at the moment speaks. Um, is fluent in 10 languages, among it uh, Chinese. And of course, she can speak the most beautiful language of the world, without any doubt. She's good at Turkish, Arabic, and even in this very exotic language. <laughs> now, ICT offers you solutions in this respect, which well, are unparalleled. I cannot do that. And the machine helps the patient to take their own history, do their own physical examination, perform their own laboratory workup, checkups, everything in their own language, but also in their own cultural background. It's not only language. If you want to explain to a Moroccan patient that you want to do prevention, doesn't understand what you're talking about. A Moroccan patient comes to a physician when he is very, very sick and has a has lots of pain. So this, what, what is all this fuss about? He's not sick at all, no pain. What are you talking about? So you need much more thorough education about these disorders in that point. So it's not only a language, it's a cultural background that needs to be dealt with as well. The referring physician is very happy because the quality of his work will increase. He's educated to treat sick people and not to perform uh, three monthly checkups without hardly any decision. It will improve the quality of my of the work of my colleagues, uh, colleagues as well. This is the scope of my talk because I think I haven't been showing this around so far. This is the first time. This is the next version of our uh, um, virtual physician. It's the mobile variant, and uh, we are building it right now. And what we cannot do is bring it into the house. We cannot bring it into the house of the patient because that is much too expensive. And but we can bring it close by. You do not need to visit our hospital to test yourself. And while you're testing, of course, we need to know if we can use these results. Is it with confidence? And we tested that, and what you see is that the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure are in good agreement when the patient measures it itself, or when we do it as physicians. And of course, body weight as well. But even, 
patient is able to make a good picture of his own retina. 95% of the patients have pictures of their own retina. And we do that as ophthalmologic follow-up of the IBC. Diabetics can become blind due to uh, a response, a growing response in their uh, vasculature. This is the same patient, and this was made by my assistant. And what you see is that there is interference due to the eye lessons. And approximately 60% of these 95% who succeed to make these pictures have better quality of their picture than we make, than when we make them. That's really something which we didn't do. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? Um, I think that they take more time for this. And the machine is more like the uh, webcam technology. You do not need uh, lots of light. And we use these uh, expensive, uh, like, like such cameras over there. <laughs> Canon. Canon cameras and uh, they need more light. Uh, that's that's the, the that's the difference. And they make small pictures and they are fused. These are actually five pictures with software. They are fused, and um, we do not need uh, uh, medication to widen the uh, pupil. And because then it would be a dangerous situation. And they need to drive home, uh, while in pupils, and <laughs> it will be a mess in our streets. <clears throat> so I think that the, the, the technology is different, uh, and actually this should be the best picture, but we are working under uh, time pressure, and the picture is, there's nothing wrong with it, I can judge it. This is a patient with 10 years, having 10 years diabetes, there's nothing wrong. It's a completely good picture, yeah. that's the good news. What do we see? <laughs> okay, uh, a tiny little bit of uh, anatomy. This is the uh, uh, place, the uh, papil. This is the place where the nerve goes out of the eye in, on its way to the brain. <coughs> you do not see with the, this part of uh, the retina. And the nerve and the uh, vessels, the arteries and the feet are closely related. So here you see the large branches of the vessels coming in and going out together with the nerve. And this is the retina, this is the yellow spot, this is the place where you focus. You're looking right now to this uh, 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 slide and your yellow spot is receiving exactly this light point there. This is the part where you see sharply. This is, this is your focus point. So this is the back of your eye, the back wall of your eye. So to conclude, our modern intercultural society needs healthcare without language and especially not cultural barriers. The patient can be a very good case manager. The collaboration between the referring physician and the virtual physician, of course, is essential. The virtual physician needs to be programmed in such a way that when you are really sick, you will be sent back to the referring physician, and he will deal with it. And that's where he is exactly trained for. He's trained to deal with sick people, and he shouldn't waste his time with screening persons. Is this system? system that you have developed in the Erasmus University, do you share that with other hospitals or with other university hospitals? We are currently, currently in the process to implement it in uh, the new model in the uh, first line and second line of care in Rotterdam. Is that an answer? But of course, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. we just tested it here and we are in the midst of uh, going outside and using it in the wild. Um, so it should be a safe system and uh, the um, 
2.0 variant shouldn't, shouldn't overestimate this self. The fewer visits uh, to care providers is, of course, very important. It, it, it's, I, if we do nothing and wait until uh, within 10 years the number of patients has been doubled, I need twice as much diabetologists in my book. And that's already impossible uh, to achieve because I, uh, 10 years is not enough to uh, educate them. So it's, it's necessary to come up with solutions. And the whole project is aimed at um, doing more with less. Thank you for your attention. We do have some questions, and maybe somebody from the audience as well. Um, how much money do you save by implementing this at the Erasmus? Um, that's a very difficult uh, question. Um, the, firstly, the Erasmus population is not very suited uh, to be tested and followed <coughs> completely by the system. Right. I think if you look to the Dutch uh, population with diabetes, approximately 70% of these patients can, be full, can, can receive full follow-up by the system. Yes. In the Erasmus MCA, I expect that we can reduce these almost nine visits to five visits here. Right. Meaning that we can, uh, do not need to enlarge our outpatient clinic. And we do not need to get more uh, nurses, etc. Et but you have to have some guesstimate uh, yeah, on how many costs you save or not. Yeah, I think that, that well, the, the hospitals are all about business cases. Yes, yes. yes. I, I expect that we can do uh, twice as much uh, patient for the uh, uh, price we are paying right now. So right. that means that it's almost half, half, half the price. But I think that the, the economic figures are for the, f uh, the first line of care, the GPs, and the second line of care, the uh, non-educational hospitals. Even much better. All right. Yeah, I understand. And and uh, I had another question because he said, well, well, it's not only the translation of the doctor; it's it's also cultural backgrounds that they have another menu or something like that. So how do you how do you interact with another cultural background in, in this system? Actually, the software is built in a way that every possible answer is already available and is a movie. Uh, and of course, we thought it was it's so complex and big, we make text, but there not all our patients can read. So we make movies. And so there's a decision uh, um, tree, and then uh, you answer the machine, and then you go in a certain direction, and the machine thinks, well, you're gaining weight again. And then in your Hindu diet, you get explanation. Um, about how to reduce your weight. And how is that different in a Hindu in a Hindu way or in a, let's say, Belgian way? The Hindu, Hindus uh, eat lots of uh, carbohydrates, yeah. too much. They eat, uh, if, we, if we could remove uh, rice from the recipes, I think that- <laughs> That would be- That would be one big torture. One big Yeah, so, so, so what you say in a Hindu version, um, Probably you eat too much rice. Yeah, in our in our we have a huge Hindu population in uh, Rotterdam, and we already with our uh, uh, 1.0 approaches we already did that. Right. And all our Hindu, I think actually the best motivated patients, they are all going to the gym, and they are all uh, getting leaner. And uh, actually, there is no subgroup that's reacting uh, that good on our uh, approaches. Right. So it's, it's a good example of that, that it can work, but of course in the Hindu community um, they realize that um, it, uh, it is a huge problem. And they see very young people with kidney failure on dialysis, they see very young uh, nephews, brothers, sisters being blind, etc. Yeah, so it's a big problem. And they are very motivated to get rid of this diabetes risk. I'm really looking forward to a 2.0 version of mobile 2.0. When is it coming out? When is it ready? Uh, the coming, coming months. Coming months. Yeah. Right. I'll be watching. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much.
we have come to uh, the, the end of today, but before we do that, I would like to give Nanette uh, the opportunity to speak to us again, uh, maybe to have some kind of uh, rebuttal, uh, some kind of... Uh, what do you yeah, want to say? Well, it's, a, it's a dangerous moment because I'm currently between you and the drink, so I don't think that's a, a very safe uh, place to be. Um, what I hope this afternoon has showed you is that if you take very different disciplines, uh, and particularly the first and the last speaker were very different disciplines from what most of the people here in the room deal with on a daily basis, if you take mobility and you look at it from different angles, it tells you quite a lot. And what we try to do as ELM, and I think this is also the moment for my team to stand up and wave their hands. So Archie, could you stand up? Archie Pollock. Vitske <laughs> Sigersma. Joseph at the back, Joseph <laughs> And Diana left Rache. <laughs> somebody who joined us just today and who will start on Monday. Uh, Alfa Maria, where are you? <laughs> um, what we try as a team to do is to look at mobility from very, very different angles. And the people here in this room I either working at the university, dealing with either careers advice or international students, and the other half of the group is people dealing with expats, international SMEs, and some other people that work with both groups. Um, and what we hope to achieve with DAS today is that you understand that in our team we bring together knowledge from different ends and we try to look at international mobility from various angles and um, because we're really convinced um, that the future of mobility is in fact a group like this. This is a picture I took myself at an ISEC conference, a student organization, where they organized an international conference at Malta. They're good at picking the nice locations. And I think this is really the future of mobility. People from very, very different backgrounds working together. And if you have kids nowadays, if they grow up, and I know some of you have just graduated kids who just got their diplomas with their degrees uh, yesterday, um, this group of people, when they grow up and when they start working, they will no longer be working in a one-dimensional world. Although we both agree the world is flat, um, we do understand that it's not one-dimensional. So a flat world still requires people with very international skills you need to be able to speak different languages, but more importantly, also need to be able to understand how different cultures <laughs> interact and how that, that works together. And that's what we work on in a daily basis and that we try to achieve. And I hope that today has sort of given you a little bit of an insight in what our daily work is about. You've done that very well. Thank you very much. you are the last speaker before we go to the drinks, but uh, I heard somebody would like to say something before we go to, you don't want to say, hmm? no, I don't I understand say anything. Something. Yes. I want to say something. Miska wants to say something. Yeah, but with the tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, wow. I'm, I'm just stepping out here. <laughs> started your own company, and now we're all here to celebrate. Um, we think you built up a really great flourishing business, and we are happy to take part of the ELM team. Um, well, all project we run has something to do with international labor mobility, um, which may have become clear this afternoon. <laughs> and also, our team is pretty international, but as a company, we are based here in Rotterdam. 
So that's why I would like to give you this. Nanette, congratulations. Thank you. 